from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, the podcast for contemporary sculptors working in the figurative tradition. I'm your host, Jason Arkels, podcasting from Florence, where all the great sculptors are dead, and I don't feel so well myself. Now, before we begin, if you want to see images of the sculpture I'll be talking about in this episode, it's easy enough to do an image search for the sculptors and sculpture on your favorite search engine. Or, if you're online, you can cruise over to our website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and check out this episode's image gallery, which is episode number two, Donatello, an introduction. So, a question I get a lot living in Florence, as I do, is who is my favorite sculptor from the Florentine Renaissance? Now, when I reply with the name Donatello, people sometimes are a bit taken aback, as they are fully expecting me to say Michelangelo. And uh, the response I get is generally a slight pause and then a, Oh, yeah, Donatello, right. Yeah, he's, he's real good. I sometimes get the feeling that if it were not for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, I would probably just get a blank stare. As it is, most people know the name Donatello and know he was an old master of some sort, and that's just about it. If I had to explain Donatello in just one sentence to someone who knew nothing about him, I would state that Donatello invented Western European sculpture. That's not so much of an exaggeration as it might first sound. He was alive during the transition from Gothic art to the art of the early Renaissance. Now, he didn't cause that transition. The sea change from the Gothic era to the early Renaissance was a huge one with many, many, many factors in play. But his pioneering technical advances in sculpture, as well as much of his personal aesthetic style, became the foundation of what sculpture transitioned into. Donatello's work became the uh, starting point from which other sculptors measured their own work and their success. He, in large part, provided the first generation of Renaissance sculptors with the means to escape the formulas of the ubiquitous Gothic style, this international Gothic style, and expanded the nature and scope of what sculpture could be and could do more than any one person has before or since. But if what I say is true, then why is he not more famous than Michelangelo? Why are not Donatello's works more celebrated uh, than Bernini or Rodin? Now, to understand why this is, I turn to a useful analogy. When explaining Donatello, I often compare him to Charlie Chaplin. You know, Charlie Chaplin, the old silent film star whose most famous character was the little tramp, a vagabond with baggy trousers and cane, a little Hitler mustache. Now, everyone knows who he is. Even today, a century after he started in film, Charlie Chaplin is iconic, right? Chaplin is recognized as the first true genius of film. But when was the last time you saw a Charlie Chaplin film? Have you ever seen a Charlie Chaplin film? And when you last saw one, might you admit that perhaps you were a little bit bored? Well, here's the thing. Charlie Chaplin was a genius. He initiated the visual language upon which all cinema stands. He popularized the close-up shot, the pan, the zoom. His narrative structures for the films he wrote raised film from a spectacle to an art. He starred in the films he wrote. He edited and directed. He even composed the soundtrack scores to them. Charlie Chaplin didn't invent the motion picture camera, but he transformed the nature and the language of cinema. But the problem we have today with Chaplin's works is that all his innovations have been improved upon. Eventually, someone came along and improved upon everything Chaplin pioneered. Successive generations of filmmakers, they stand on the shoulders of Charlie Chaplin, and without him, the cinema today might have a different landscape. I can think of several examples of people born at the right time, on the advent of a new technology or cultural shift, who then paved the way for things to come. Along with Charlie Chaplin, we might think of Nikola Tesla, whose work in the infant field of electricity and electronics is still relevant and inspiring. Maybe Henry Ford or, or Steve Jobs. Donatello is in this same class of innovators. Again, he didn't invent sculpture, but he formulated the sculptural language that flourished in the early Renaissance. And the sculptors who came after him, even Michelangelo, and in fact, especially Michelangelo, they were all standing on Donatello's shoulders. And eventually, 
Each of Donatello's achievements was superseded at some point by the talents of later sculptors. And this is why, like Charlie Chaplin, we all know Donatello's name, but few of us are familiar with many of his works. There are a few other factors about Donatello's work that makes him difficult to appreciate today. One factor is that his work is not conveniently defined by a, a certain style or, or genre or quality. He did so many different things in so many mediums, and he never really focused on a single direction for very long. We can't even talk about his work having an early style or a mature style. He experimented all his life, and his achievements and masterpieces are evenly dispersed throughout his career and are vastly different from each other. Now, we can talk about the, the struggling ideal forms of Michelangelo or the exuberant virtuosity of Bernini, but we can't generalize about Donatello in the same way. It's sometimes difficult to believe that all his masterpieces are actually from the same guy, that the inventor of the sublime style of relief known as Staciato is the same sculptor of the Bronze David, the same sculptor of the Marble Cantoria, and the same artist who produced the gilded wooden Mary Magdalene. His work as a whole simply defies characterization. Yet another factor that tends to distance him from us is that Donatello was, in a general way, working towards goals that have little to do with what we nowadays hold to be the central tenet of art, and that is physical beauty. The production of beautiful work was not the primary driver for Donatello. Now, to be sure, a few of Donatello's works are beautiful, but it's a secondary concern for him. When Donatello's work is beautiful, it's usually because his work is truthful and accurate in rendering a form or concept that is in itself beautiful. That's almost the opposite of idealization, right? Where you take principles of beauty and you overlay them on a subject that may in itself not be beautiful. For example, when John Bologna sculpts the human form, it's always beautiful. But it's hardly ever truthful in the sense of physical accuracy of the natural form of his living model, right? Because John Bologna idealized his forms. He was a classicist. And he took his ideas of beauty from Greek and Roman examples of art, and also from Michelangelo, who was a classicist. He had all these other sources rather than nature. Now, just about the only thing Donatello did not pioneer was a full exploration of the classic ideal, which ended up being a central motive to work of sculptors contemporary with Donatello and the main influence, if not preoccupation, of figurative art for the three centuries which came after. In fact, it wasn't until the 19th century that some sculptors broke free of the chokehold of classicism and turned back to Donatello as a guide and inspiration, some going as far as self-consciously referring to themselves as the Neo-Florentines, thus allying themselves with the work and the, and the goals and the methods of Donatello. Finally, we need to understand exactly what sculpture was and what it was not when Donatello hit the scene. To understand how he broadened the scope of sculpture, we need to understand first what the scope of sculpture was before he arrived. This is probably our biggest stumbling block to a, a true appreciation of Donatello, because the Renaissance is absolutely cluttered with masterpieces, but almost all of them came after Donatello. So first off, we have to sort of clear our minds here and, and get into the mindset of the, uh, the, the Trecento, the 1300s, before Donatello arrived. So throw off any notions of the art world as we know it, all right? You have to imagine yourself toiling away in a dusty workshop in the year, say, 1380. Outside your studio, there are no galleries, no museums, no collectors, no art schools, no exhibitions, none of that, none of that. The trade of sculptor uh, was as expansive as any other trade, like a blacksmith or a carpenter, which is to say, not expansive at all. When someone had a need for your services, you were contracted to produce. So you learned as an apprentice, and you did what you were told. And as a master, you followed the norms, conventions, and best practices of the day in order to produce a work of standard quality. There's no indulgent impulses towards self-expression, no throwing off conventions because you were a genius and you had a mandate to make the world see itself through a fresh and unique set of eyes. No, 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 none of that. Your job was to meet expectations, not produce a novelty. And what were you producing? Small nudes in bronze to be sold in galleries like everyone seems to do now? Far from it. You had exactly two clients, two sets of clients. You had the church 
and the nobility. As for the nobility, you might produce a family crest in stone every once in a while, or a decorative fireplace mantle, but that was just about it. Maybe a small devotional figure of the Madonna for a private chapel, but that sort of falls under the category of church work, really. Do you do portrait busts? No, that wasn't a thing. Didn't really exist. Public fountains? Monuments? Almost never. And usually the job called for architects and masons, not a sculptor, unless some decorative motif were desired. You might, if you were lucky, do a, a life-size tomb figure, like a tomb effigy, uh, sort of lying on top of a, a stone sarcophagus. That would be about the height of, of your achievement as a sculptor in the Trecento. Now, your main client, really, outside of nobility, was the church. And your main job was to provide ornament for the architecture of churches. Now, are we talking large, freestanding statues? No. Most often, your work was in relief decoration around baptismal fonts or pulpits, on altars, on the walls and the facade of the church itself. If you got lucky, you got to work making figures for niches. Nothing in the round, no figure groups, just usually a bearded saint in flowing robes holding some attribute like a, a book or a key or a bishop's crook. Now, not only were you limited to, uh, to the genre of niche figures and reliefs and small devotional statues and and decoration, you were probably also limited to working in various types of stone and marble. It's likely that you weren't doing anything at all in bronze or any other kind of metal. Because you see, and this is, this is fundamental, there was a division of labor back then that does not exist for sculptors today. In the 14th century, you were either a carver in stone and marble or wood, or you were a goldsmith. Goldsmiths actually, well, they, they handed, handled more metals than just gold, but that's what they were known as. Uh, so there were carvers and there were goldsmiths. These were two completely different trades. And that's not really surprising, as each involves a completely different skill set than the other, even if the finished result might be similar. Both could produce a relief, for example, but how you arrive at a bronze relief is totally different than how you arrive at a relief in stone, right? The differences should be obvious. But one of the most important differences in skill sets is that goldsmiths, they needed to be expert modelers in clay or actually more usually wax. Carvers, well, they didn't need to know how to manipulate clay or wax beyond the ability to produce a small rough sketch, little sketch model in small scale, if they chose to use a model at all when working stone. More often, the design for, say, a relief could just be sketched out right on the surface of the uncarved stone and the details would be worked out as you carved. Now, whether or not you needed a sketch model for figures would depend on how well you knew your formulas and proportions, the basic theoretical and formulaic knowledge of the trade of Carver. You would apply this knowledge, this, these formulas, to one figure after another, varying the formula a little bit to convey the difference between a Madonna or a Mary Magdalene, for example. And the more experience you had, the less you needed to rely on a sketch model. But if you were a goldsmith, your end product depended very much on your ability to model in wax, as the end product must be cast directly from a model. And so modeling was therefore a more developed skill for goldsmiths. Every once in a while, though, you'd get a guy who learned how to do both. Way back around 1300, Arnolfo di Cambio, the great architect and sculptor, he seems to have done both marble and bronze on a life scale, Though, the single large bronze work attributed to him is kind of in question. But then in the 1330s and the 1340s, you have the great Andrea Pisano, who definitely, certainly did both, and he did both excellently well. His example of working both marble and bronze, that seems to be picked up by his student, Andrea Orcagna, and then others, and, and the idea of cross-pollination between carving and casting seems to have spread from that time into the 1400s. But it was still kind of new. It was a new kind of idea in Donatello's day, this cross-pollination, and Donatello's day being at the beginning of the 1400s. This cross-pollination between goldsmiths and carvers is very, very, very important. It's one of the fundamental changes in techniques for sculptors that played a part in the revolution of art during the early Renaissance. So with that as a background, let's crack Donatello open and, and see what he was really all about. Now, this episode cannot hope to cover everything that Donatello achieved, and some facets of his work deserve their own separate episode. 
So today I'm just going to give an overview of his life and work very briefly, and then return to a single work of his for a, a deeper analysis so we can better understand some of his contributions to art. But this is not the last time Donatello will crop up in the podcast. Now, he was born in 1386. His full name is Donato di Niccolò di Beto Bardi, and he was born in Florence. He trained as a goldsmith in his youth, which at the time seemed to be becoming a common route for those wishing to work in the statuary arts to begin their art training. Now, the sculptors and architects Filippo Brunelleschi and Lorenzo Ghiberti, each about seven or eight years older than Donatello, also trained as goldsmiths. These three artists, Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, and Donatello, they knew each other, and they were friends and rivals throughout their lives. They were born at a most interesting time in Florence. They started their professional careers just as several major architectural projects were ramping up in Florence. The largest by far was that of the Florence Cathedral Complex. Now, in those days, an Italian cathedral, and by the way, a cathedral is a church, but it's presided over by a bishop and not just a priest. Uh, so the cathedral complex of Florence involved, well, everywhere in Italy, involved three separate buildings. So the first of the three buildings would be a cathedral, you know, the cathedral itself, the church, and that was called a duomo. Uh, and then the baptistry was a smaller structure containing a chapel and a baptismal font. And those who were not baptized were not allowed to enter the Duomo, and so the place for baptism itself was outside in this separate sort of outbuilding called the Baptistry. And then finally, you have the bell tower of the cathedral, which is called the Campanile. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is actually the Campanile for the Duomo of Pisa, in case you ever wondered what that tower was there for in the first place. Now, the Duomo... Uh, the Florence Duomo had been started a century previous, replacing a yet older church, but there was much work to be done on the facade, and the church itself at this time had no dome. It was unfinished. The baptistry was built on the foundations of an old Roman building, so the baptistry itself was already centuries old, but it was being renovated, and the Campanile had been finished a few decades before uh, in, in, the, in the 1300s, but uh, still had several large niches in need of sculptures. So in 1401, a competition was held in order to select a sculptor for a set of bronze doors for the baptistry. Donatello was still a teenager, and he didn't compete. But out of the six sculptors who did, it really came down to Ghiberti and Brunelleschi. Ghiberti won, and Brunelleschi, who didn't take losing all that well, decided to head to Rome and explore the ruins of the classic world there. Donatello either went with him then or at some point joined him. That's a bit murky, but eventually the two of them kicked around Rome for a couple of years, teaching themselves about classical architecture, taking measurements and making drawings, and earning a little money on the side as goldsmiths in the Roman workshops. This experience would have a profound effect on Brunelleschi, who would later design the dome of the Florence Duomo, uh, based on his minute observation of the dome on the Roman Pantheon. The influence of Rome on Donatello, it's a bit more subtle. His work was never as classicist as, as Ghiberti's or, or Nani de Banco. Mostly, the classic world influenced his sense of design and architectural decoration. Whatever influence classical statuary had on the statues of Donatello, the figures, he was really able to make it his own. I mean, apart from occasional idealism in some of his faces, you don't really find the conscious emulation of the classical world like you do in contemporaries work like like Ghiberti, as I mentioned, or Nani de Banco. So back in Florence, Donatello returns around the age of 20, and he went to work on several projects starting in 1407 or so. He also finds work in the newly opened foundry and workshop of Lorenzo Ghiberti, the winner of the Baptistry Doors competition. And this workshop of Ghiberti's became the center of artistic creativity and advancement throughout the first half of the 15th century in Florence. Uh, it took Ghiberti 20 some odd years, I think 24, 25 years, just to complete those doors. And then as soon as he completed those, he actually awarded, was awarded the commission to do a second set of doors, which took him another 20 years. So for half a century, this workshop was a hive of activity and a center of, of learning and, and sort of a, a a, a mixing pot for all sculptors in Florence. On his own, Donatello's first large work was for the facade of the Duomo, a St. John the Evangelist. It's a, it's a seated marble figure, a little bit over life-size, 
and it amply illustrates his burgeoning skills and talent, especially when you compare it to similar works being done for the Duomo uh, by older, more experienced sculptors. You know, even though he was in his early 20s, he was competing, well, not competing, he was working alongside other people doing similar commissions who were twice his age. His work stands out as, as uh, being superior, even then. Now, this, uh, this uh, success in this early work led to his being awarded a few commissions for another building project going on in Florence, and this was the city grain market, now known as the Church of Orsan Michele. Now, Orsan Michele is a fascinating, fascinating place. It's, uh, it's a wonderful topic, and I'm definitely going to cover in a podcast all to itself. But what you need to know for now, basically, is that it's a, it's a market structure. It's like an open market structure with a roof, uh, kind of like a pole barn, sort of roof just supported by several pillars, whose construction was paid for by various local guilds. Now, the local guilds were similar to maybe a labor union, but at this time in Florence, the guilds also controlled local politics, so they were very powerful and sort of vied with each other for control sometimes. Now, for their financial assistance in building this market, each guild was allowed to have a votive niche on one of the pillars of the structure, all right? And they could decorate their niche with a statue of their particular guild's patron saint. It's basically corporate sponsorship. The decoration of these niches provided an opportunity for the various guilds to show off their wealth and influence, and so this meant that the guilds were looking to hire the best sculptors they could to produce the most skilled, elaborate, or expensive work possible. Remember when I said that sculptors either worked for nobility or for the church? Well, now they had corporate guilds as a patron as well, and what the guilds were after in a sculpture was very different from what a church required. At Or San Michele, Donatello first sculpts a St. Mark for the Linen Weavers Guild, and then a St. George for the Guild of Armorers. Now, the St. Mark was regarded very highly, but the St. George won Donatello instant fame. To explain why, let's, uh, let's read from a book by Giorgio Vasari. Giorgio Vasari was an artist and writer living in Florence a century after Donatello, but he wrote the first modern art history, and it's called The Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors, and Architects. More commonly, it's just referred to as the lives. And so this is what uh, Giorgio Vasari says about uh, Donatello's St. George, and I'll quote you. For the Guild of Armorers, he made a most spirited figure of St. George in armor, in the head of which there may be seen the beauty of youth, courage, and valor in arms, and a proud and terrible ardor. And there is a marvelous suggestion of life bursting out of the stone. It is certain that no modern figure in marble has yet shown such vivacity and such spirit as nature and art produced in this one by means of the hand of Donato. So that's pretty strong stuff for a guy living during Michelangelo's lifetime to say that no one had shown such vivacity and spirit in a sculpture more than Donatello. I imagine that if Donatello had died right after this work was done, he still would have achieved a place in the pantheon of Renaissance sculptors, as the St. George represented a paradigm shift from the Gothic to the Florentine Renaissance. It's commonly regarded by many as the first truly Renaissance sculpture. Now, we're going to return to the St. George, and we're going to get into how and why this sculpture is so special, but I'm going to finish the, uh, the basic biography of Donatello first. So, back to Orsan Michele. Donatello for Orsan Michele also sculpts the, the decorative border of the niche, which contains his St. George, and this was common practice for most of the niches on Orsan Michele to be decorated by the sculptors who made the, made the sculptures to go into the niches. And even with this decorative border, Donatello's work is breaking new ground. Directly below the base of the niche, Donatello places a relief panel called a predella. It's a small relief of St. George fighting the dragon and rescuing a princess. But this relief panel was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. For one thing, it is the earliest known stacciato relief, and Donatello is credited with the invention of stacciato. Now, stacciato, or sometimes called scacciato, means flattened. A common yummy treat here in Florence is a type of flatbread drizzled with, with uh, olive oil. It's called scacciata. Uh, so it's flattened bread, right? And stacciato relief is indeed a flattened relief, which is, which is different from high relief. High relief is basically figures in the round or, or close to it being uh, sort of attached to a back panel. 
But stacciato is also different from low relief, like the type we find on the Parthenon frieze in Athens. Relief like the Parthenon frieze contains layers of figures and objects which are indeed flattened and, and not in the round, but they convey their subjects primarily through the outlines of those figures, or the relief of those figures. And their positions of depth relative to other objects in the relief, they're not the same. You see, stacciato, it, it does all this. It conveys through uh, its profiles as well. But, but rather than truly flatten a volume in the work, what stacciato relief actually does is compress this volume. All right. So the relative depths over a surface of a torso or a face, the ratios of one depth to another depth and all other depths in the relief remain the same. That is, the ratio of depths from uh, a form in the round and a form in stacciato relief are equal. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining this very well. The relative depths and projections are equal. That means when a light source hits a stacciato relief, those compressed forms produce the same shadow patterns as would appear on the same form rendered in the round. So this gives a much more realistic illusion of depth than just regular low relief, which may or may not have a convincing illusion of depth as conveyed by the shadows the relief casts. Now, if, if you didn't quite understand what I just tried to explain, you're totally forgiven. It's, it's hard to understand what I mean uh, without seeing an example of it. So take a look at the image gallery for this episode at thesculptorsfuneral.com to get a better idea. Or just go online, Google Donatello uh, Relief, and, uh, and you might get an idea. But to read a more detailed explanation of Stacciato Relief, I recommend the sculpture manual written by Brenda Putnam in, in 1948. It's called The Sculptor's Way. She provides a very helpful diagram that explains exactly what I'm talking about. Although she doesn't even mention Donatello or even the, the term stacciato, she only refers to this type of relief as being true low relief. And a lot of people have used that idea of true relief. Um, Edward Lanteri in the late 19th, early 20th century talks about true low relief as well. And they're referring to stacciato. You know what? If you, if you want to look at some really amazing stacciato, next to Donatello himself, probably the person who, who did it better than anyone else, would have to be Augustus St. Gaudens. He's an American sculptor, mid uh, or late 19th century, early 20th century even, uh, American sculptor, and he probably comes closest to besting Donatello at Stacciato. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do well. Uh, and nowadays, it's, it's kind of the specialty of metalists and uh, numismatics, you know, those who make reliefs for, for coin currency or, or metals or such objects. Stacciato Relief deserves its own podcast, in fact, so I'm not going to go further here, but, but check it out. It's, it's pretty great stuff. Back to Donatello's Predella under the St. George. So it's a groundbreaking relief for its early, maybe even the first use of Stacciato Relief. But that's only half the story with this relief. It's also the first relief to use one-point perspective to provide an even greater illusion of depth to the background. There is a receding checkerboard pavement within an architectural structure a receding colonnade and, and trees and rock formations, all placed and rendered according to this new optical science perspective. And it was very, very new when Donatello was doing this. Twenty years before, Leon Battista Alberti wrote his treatise, De Pittura, which codifies and explains the principles of visual perspective for the first time in, in writing. It's even before Brunelleschi and Paolo Uccello were experimenting with and demonstrating the uses of perspective, at least in public in painting and drawing. It's impossible to credit any one artist with the eureka moment of the science of perspective, as all these artists were collaborating, again, in Ghiberti's famous workshop. They all worked there during those years. And the formation of perspective may well have been a, a collaboration as well. People usually attribute it to Brunelleschi, but Donatello is the first, it seems, to apply it to sculpted relief. Unfortunately, the relief was left outside on the facade of Orsan Michele for centuries. It wasn't moved into the Bargello, the National Sculpture Museum here in Florence, until the 1970s. And this relief has deteriorated sadly over the centuries, and is a shadow of what it must have been 600 years ago. Anyway, moving on. So in Donatello's work, through the next couple of decades, the 1420s and the 1430s, Donatello pursues marble stacciato relief work and produces several uh, notable works in relief. And 
in his uh, in his work for figures for niches, we see a a gradual emergence of the human figure, kind of from underneath the figure's clothing, right? The figures that Donatello made for the Campanile, you know, the bell tower of the Florence Duomo, it effectively charts the course of Donatello's exploration of the human figure and how to render it. Three sculptures by Donatello, known as the Bearded Prophet, the Beardless Prophet, and the Prophet Jeremiah, have all been recently restored. And uh, they're now actually on display in the baptistry at ground level right now at the moment as I'm recording. I have some pictures of that on the website, so check it out. It's pretty interesting. As we examine each of these sculptures, as well as a fourth sculpture he made for the Campanile of the prophet Habakkuk, uh, which is known as Il Zucone, or Pumpkinhead, due to the, the statue's bald head, as we examine these statues, it is apparent that Donatello is formulating a method of working directly from observation of the human form, i.e. from from live models. Now, it should be pointed out that the systematic study of anatomy did not exist at this point. Not until Leonardo da Vinci comes along a few decades down the road do we get the scientific and objective study of anatomy that so characterizes the High Renaissance. So Donatello's approach to the figure in these works seems largely informed by some visual system of observation. Successively, in these in these three or four sculptures, we see at first kind of a tentative and then eventually a more bold rendering of the human form. The heads move closer and closer to portraiture. Uh, more of the body is revealed, you know, bare hands and wrists become bare arms up to the shoulder, revealing a bare chest even. And the anatomical structure seems very well observed indeed. Now, the movement towards naturalism in Donatello's work reached its high point. Uh, a few years after the Campanile Prophets, with his statue of the David, the Old Testament shepherd boy who uh, defeats the giant Goliath with his sling and his stone. Donatello represents David as being almost fully nude, except for a big floppy hat and some some shin guards. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, but it's the first large nude statue of the Renaissance and is also the first freestanding statue. It's not made for a niche, but it was meant as a, a centerpiece for a garden belonging to Cosimo Medici. Remember that up until this time, almost all statuary served as decoration for churches and buildings. It wasn't until private wealth in Florence, like the wealth of Cosimo Medici, reaches a certain point that large private commissions like Donatello's David become possible. Now, I'm going to cover the David in a later podcast or two when I talk about the advent of the nude in sculpture, or maybe I'll talk about it when I talk about visual methods of modeling. There's a lot of topics that the David is pertinent to, but it was a game-changing triumph of art and technology and intellect, every bit as important as the St. George is, and as every bit as important as Staccato Relief is. I think you can understand now why Donatello is my favorite. I mean, this guy just did everything. Okay, but then, after the success of the naturalism and nudity of the David, he moves in a completely different direction. He never again does a work that approaches the visual naturalism in the human nude as the David does. We see a lot of this in Donatello. He, he invents a new paradigm, masters it, and then moves on to chart other unknown regions in sculpture. So after this, after the David, what does he do? What doesn't he do? The dude finds work in Rome, in Siena, and elsewhere besides Florence, creating reliefs, figures, monuments, mostly for churches, but his work veers away from marble in these years. Donatello is more drawn to experimenting in bronze, achieving naturalistic and stylistic effects in the metal's malleable surface. He is also experimenting in every other medium he can get his hands on. Wood, stucco, terracotta. He, he opened up new genres and new technical processes along the way, too. I mean, for instance, are you a fan of Luca della Robbia, you know, the colorful glazed terracotta sculpture of the della Robbia family? Well, Donatello did it first. He pioneered ceramic glazes over relief work way back in 1410. Uh, he made a portrait bust as well, a young man with a cameo, it's called, and this is the first portrait bust since antiquity. He went to Padua. He sculpted a monument to Erasmo di Narni, who was a famous mercenary there, and this monument was the first bronze equestrian statue since antiquity, and it became the model for all other equestrian statues that followed for centuries after. Now, um, one can effectively argue that each of these revivals of genres which were created in antiquity, these revivals were going to be inevitable. 
If not Donatello, then someone else within a few years would have come along and made a first portrait bust or a first bronze horse, sure. But the fact is, so many of these revivals happened at the hand of a single sculptor, and that means that Donatello's personal style, his manner of execution, and his technical processes become the pattern which others either emulated or pushed back from. His styles and tastes were the starting point from which Renaissance sculpture blossomed. If, if Renaissance sculpture was a virus, Donatello would be patient zero. So in his later years, Donatello, his works, they, they take a decidedly expressive turn. His uh, Penitent Magdalene, a work in wood, stucco, and gilding is a standing figure of Mary Magdalene caught in the act of prayer and supplication. And it has no precedence in art, not, not in Gothic art, not in antique art. It has few equals. Its unadorned realism is both astonishingly beautiful and a bit grotesque. In this work, created when Donatello was over the age of 60, he brings a fitting close to his pursuit of visual fidelity to an individual human form, as earlier realized in the David, and at the same time accomplishes the feat of drawing the viewer into the mind of the Mary Magdalene, into her spiritual realm of penitence and suffering, in the same way that we're drawn into the world of St. George, which I'll explain in a minute. It's, it's one of the simplest and purest communications of unadorned emotion in a sculpted figure I know of. It is, it is expressionism. It's kind of the definition of expressionism. Now, Donatello, he died in 1466 and is buried in the Church of San Lorenzo here in Florence next to his friend and patron, Cosimo Medici. Now, when I give a lecture on Donatello, usually the last PowerPoint slide I'll show is uh, three works side by side. It'll be the John the Evangelist, the one he did on the Duomo, one of his first ones. Uh, then I'll show the Bronze David and the Mary Magdalene. These three works, they span Donatello's career but they also encompass a good portion of what we know as Western European sculpture. It's hard to imagine these works, as I've mentioned, so diverse as they are, as being by a single hand and a single mind. So that's his life, in a very small nutshell. There's tons more, of course, uh, and a good place to start learning more would be our main man, Giorgio Vasari. Uh, in his life of Donatello, Vasari includes a lot of entertaining anecdotes and personal information about Donatello relating to his personality and that sort of thing. Stuff that was probably passed down as studio gossip for a couple generations. So it's probably all based in truth, and it's probably all kind of not true as well. So take it with a grain of salt, but it's a great read nonetheless. So I hope by now I've impressed upon you that Donatello was an artist of true greatness. But it's one thing to say this work or that work was really important and influential, and another thing to understand why. So let's come back to one sculpture that I've talked about, the St. George, and break it down in real and practical terms and discover why it was so important. Just what makes the St. George so special? Well, several things, all of which are a little difficult for us to appreciate now nowadays. As, as I mentioned, uh, in order to appreciate much of what Donatello achieved with his work, we have to forget all that we know about the sculpture that comes after it. It's not easy. For one thing, we have to remember that all full-size figures in stone created in Florence up to that point followed certain conventions, both classical and Gothic, almost without exception. Right? So figure sculptures were works whose bodies generally were swimming in copious drapery, togged from head to foot. The only skin showing would have been the face, which was almost always bearded, making the job of sculpting the neck a little bit easier. Uh, the hands would also be visible and maybe a foot. But for the most part, the form of the figure underneath this drapery was only implied. Sculpting this way is easier. The more drapery you have, the more inexact you can be about the placement of the limbs under it and get away with it. Carving drapery is largely a question of design and skill and tradition, not close observation. So sculptors could just follow a formula. Figures wrapped up in drapery in this way are also architecturally stable. The figures are practically columns, with the togas reaching all the way to the floor of the statue and providing a solid, unbroken, supporting mass all the way up to the neck. It created a very, very stable form that minimized risks for the sculpture uh, in the carving and transport and installation of the sculpture. The St. George, on the other hand, he wears tight-fitting clothes and light armor, 
that reveals the form under it more plainly than anything sculpted in Florence on this scale. There is nothing inexact about the form, nor could there be. Uh, nothing inexact about the placement of the hips or the thrust of a shoulder, the relation of hips to waist to ribcage. It's all there. It's all visible. The figure is standing on two legs, clothed in tight-fitting armor, and the negative space between the legs reaches up to the level of the thighs, a daring defiance of the solidity of stone, matched at that time only by the works of the ancients, which Donatello must have encountered in Rome and in Florence. So on a purely technical level, the work is a tour de force, unmatched by other Florentine sculptures of the time. But the St. George is not just technical bravado, it's also stylistic innovation as well. The contrapposto of Donatello's earlier St. Mark and the contrapposto of most other contemporary figures, it gives way to a novel pose. George's feet are shoulder-length apart in a solid, aggressive stance. One hand rests upon his shield, held out sort of in front away from his body, while the other, the other hand makes a fist, which can be taken as a sign of resolution and strength, but actually was meant to hold a bronze sword that the armorer's guild would put into the statue's hand on certain feast days. But anyway, the, the entire stance of the body conveys the character of St. George as a young, virile man about to spring into action. His face, that of a handsome, beardless youth, it looks out of the niche, not at the viewer, but up and over the viewer's shoulder with a brow furrowed in concentration and lips slightly parted. Now, it's almost impossible to overstate the radical nature of this pose and expression. Up to this point, statuary of this type had a simple and direct purpose, to convey an identity to the viewer. This identity, whether it's of Christ or the Virgin Mary or a saint, it was presumed to be already familiar to the viewer, I mean, to any medieval Christian. The sight of a statue of a man, say, wearing a hairy shirt and carrying a staff that had a small cross on top, that was instantly recognizable to the viewer as a statue of John the Baptist. All right, so through such attributes, you know, different physical features or manners of dress, uh, objects, symbols, sculptors endowed their statues with these identities through these symbols. The point of the statues in the first place was to basically provide a focal point of worship or contemplation for the faithful viewer. They were iconic in the original sense of the word. They are icons. They function as symbols of larger realities or truths rather than an illustration or, or narrative of, of these subjects. They served as a sort of theological shorthand. As such, these statues were expected to be clear and concise, well-made, perhaps even beautiful, but, but nothing more. Now, with this in mind, we can understand why the same basic pose of contraposto could work for any statue, be it a virgin or a martyr or a savior. Contraposto is just a pose where the weight of the figure rests on one leg kicking one hip higher than the other and then with a counterbalancing drop of one shoulder, giving the body a sort of an S-curve, right? It provides both variation and balance in the human form. And it has remained a staple pose for all figurative sculptors and painters right up until today. It has its origins in the work of the ancient Greeks, which is presumably the source of uh, the Renaissance sculptors in the early Renaissance. The pose of contraposto started to edge out an older pose characteristic of Gothic sculpture, which is sometimes called the Gothic swoop, right? The weight is still on one leg, but the, the upper body continues kind of the curve of the torso in a mildly sort of C-shaped or maybe like a banana-shaped pose rather than in an S pose. But both the Gothic swoop and contraposto were used as sort of poses that, uh, you know, one size fits all. Because in iconic or gothic sculpture, the pose is not the point. It's merely something which can add a little bit of decorative grace to the work. But what Donatello has done with the St. George is not merely come up with a new pose. The pose is here for the first time used as an attribute. But instead of it being an attribute of identity, the pose of the St. George is an attribute of character. The pose conveys not the identity of the saint, but his personality. As strange as it seems to us today, in 1417, this was unprecedented in large statuary. And we can compare Donatello's St. George to another contemporary work, which was made in a more classical idiom, to further understand what a leap the St. George really, really was. Now, immediately to the left of the St. George, on the exterior of Orsan Michele, we find 
a statue by Donatello's exact contemporary, Nani di Banco. The statue is for the niche of the Guild of Sculptors and Masons, and the subject of the sculpture is four crowned saints, or i quattro coronati. This sculpture is regarded as the first sculptural group of the Renaissance, and it depicts four sculptors living in the late Roman Empire who were martyred for refusing to sculpt pagan gods as the Roman Emperor had ordered them to. Quite a thrilling subject to work with, one might think. If today, if one of us got this commission, we would probably render the expressions on the faces of these doomed sculptors to reveal the different emotions they would have felt, anguish, piety and faith, steadfastness, etc., etc. But here, in Nani de Banca's work, we find four bearded men in togas, standing in a semicircle, expressionless, motionless, seeming to look at each other, but with no discernible emotion. In fact, if you had no idea of the sculpture's subject, you might well mistake them for a group of Roman senators, or perhaps poets or philosophers. You certainly would have no inkling as to their plight, nor their fate, nor how each of them felt about it. They could just as easily be waiting for a bus as awaiting their execution. And this sculpture was perfectly acceptable. In fact, it's Nani de Banco's masterpiece. Now compare this to the St. George, who was, they were made within just a few years of each other. And St. George, uh, he, his, his slender body seems poised for action, his gaze off into the distance as if the statue could see a dragon fast approaching. In his expression, we can read his character, even if we are unfamiliar with the story. This is the first statue with a personality sculpted into it. And because it has personality, we, the viewers, are now capable of empathy with that personality. We imbue the sculpture with an inner psychology as though it were real. For the first time, instead of the objective language of iconography telling us who St. George is, the subjectivity of our emotions determines what we perceive him to be as a living presence. For the first time, how a sculpture makes us feel becomes relevant. What could be more fundamental to the art of sculpture as we know it than that? Now, when we are able to empathize with a subject in a work of art, we say that that work is lifelike. It's like it has life. But it's more than being merely realistic. Realistic just means accurate relative to the subject. Nowadays, lifelikeness or uh, believability is a phenomenon so common in art as to be presumed as a requisite for many of the arts, especially in the dominant art forms of today, you know, film and television, uh, which rely absolutely on our ability to perceive characters in a narrative and to empathize with them. This is something theater has always done. But in sculpture, it started right here in 1417. People like Giorgio Vasari, writing in his lives, instinctively could feel this incredible, game-changing psychological phenomenon, though naturally he would be hard-pressed to speak of it in those terms. But it's what Vasari meant when he speaks of life bursting forth from the stone in this work, and when he speaks about its vivacity and spirit. So if that wasn't enough, let's go back to the idea that St. George is gazing off into the distance presumably at some future ordeal or perhaps directly at his dragon itself. Now, with that gaze into the distance, combined with St. George's expression, Donatello not only renders the first psychological state in sculpture, but he also uses that psychology to incorporate empty space outside of the sculpture into the work of art. I'll explain that. So, when we imagine the St. George staring off into the distance, we imagine him seeing the dragon, or at least we imagine he sees something and is reacting to it. Our imagination of what he sees and the real space we imagine it occupies in the distance over our right shoulders becomes essentially a part of this sculpture. The sculpture alludes to something that seems to exist outside its own physical space, formed not by the sculptor, but by our minds. It's as though somehow either the sculpture has left its realm and entered our world, or we are now in the sculpture's reality. I mean, the line between art and reality becomes a bit fuzzy. Now, what Donatello achieved with the St. George was, of course, emulated and copied by other artists, and as I mentioned, has become fundamental to our perception of what figurative art is. A century later, John Lorenzo Bernini would fully explore blurring the lines between art and its surrounding space, 
But one of the most shining examples of Donatello's influence in this particular vein came just two generations after Donatello's death, when a young but ambitious Florentine, who thought of Donatello as being the only sculptor whose work was worth looking at, wished to compete and even best Donatello at his own game. And this brash young sculptor put into his own work that same gaze of concentration towards a presumed foe off in the distance. That sculptor was Michelangelo, and the sculpture, of course, is his own David. So that's it for now for Donatello. I hope you enjoyed it half as much as I did. I always get so excited talking about him, and I'm sure it won't be long before I talk about him again. He's just that fundamental. Speaking of fundamentals, next week we're going to discuss the most fundamental material to our craft, clay. What is it? Where does it come from? How can we sculptors alter its properties to get it to do what we want? It's going to be a whole episode devoted to talking about clay. And if this topic sounds boring to you, then you are exactly the sculptor who needs to listen. Because it is anything but boring, and it just might change the way you use clay. All right, it looks like we have just a little bit of listener mail after the the first uh, episode last week. Um, One question that a few people asked me, actually, uh, well, two questions, really. One is, how often will the podcasts air? And will the history podcasts be in chronological order? Well, the first question, how often will the podcasts air? My initial idea for the podcast was that it would be a weekly sort of thing. I didn't actually know how long the uh, the episodes were going to be running. It looks like uh, they're going to be running at a little bit under an hour each time. Um, and that's a lot of work. So what I'd like to do is actually start off as a weekly podcast and keep it going weekly for as long as I can. I imagine, though, depending on my schedule and depending on the ease of, uh, of ability of researching some of these topics that are coming up, I might be moving to a twice-monthly sort of format. But for now, they're going to be weekly, at least for the next month or so. Uh, and after that, we'll see. But I'm, I'm thinking of having it run sort of like as, a, as a, an academic year, basically. So I'll start off in the fall, run through till June, and then take the summer off. I'll probably have a little bit of a spring break and a Christmas break as well. So that's that's my initial plan. We'll see how it goes. Now, will the history podcasts be chronological? Yes and no. Yes and no. I thought about doing it chronologically, but the thing is, I mean, I could I could go on for a month's worth of podcasts and not leave the topic of Donatello. And so that means that it would take me years to get to some of the more interesting topics like uh, well, 19th century French sculpture, for instance. Also, if I did it in a strictly chronological order, what happens if I sort of uh, discover some unknown at least unknown to me, uh, gem, and I've already moved on past that era, then I have to go backwards, and, and, you know, if people are expecting it to be chronological, then it gets weird. So, the idea now will be that it's going to be chronologically, but thematic, right? So for this first, uh, for this first season of episodes, this first academic year of episodes, I'm going to move through the history of art from, from Donatello up into the, the modern era, uh, but touching only on sort of the game changers, I guess you could say. So people like Donatello, and then of course we'll talk about Michelangelo, we'll talk about Bernini, we'll talk about Francois Rude, we'll talk about Rodin, all the people that really changed the nature uh, or scope or, you know, just sort of, you know, loomed large on the horizons of sculpture. And also, it's not just about uh, sculptors. I'll be talking about the big uh, sort of movements, important events that shaped sculpture, such as the formation of the uh, French Academy and the École de Beaux-Arts. I'll probably talk about the Enlightenment, certainly, the French Revolution, Napoleon. Those sorts of things will, will crop up. We've already talked about the impact of the First World War and then the Russian Revolution in our first episode. So that's going to be sort of the nature of the history podcast. And and remember, I'm going to be including other types of podcasts as well. Other episodes will include Shop Talk, like next week's on uh, Clay. And then, um, you know, other things like plaster working, bronze working, marble working, all that sort of stuff. And interviews as well. I'm looking forward to recording my first interview next week. So look for that in the coming month. 
So I hope you keep listening to the sculptor's funeral. And don't forget, you can add to the conversation by going to our Facebook page. I didn't really get a whole lot of uh, listener comments and mail, and I, I really want to make it a big part of uh, of the of the podcast. So seriously, if you have questions or comments about anything at all, anything at all, let me know. Well, anyway, that's uh, that's it for this week. Thanks for listening, and, and don't forget to spread the word about the podcast if you like it. I'll see you next week.